7. We'll read verses 15 to 20. A tree and its fruit is the subtitle here. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. So the true and the false, that's what we're dealing with. What is, what is true? What is false? How do we recognize it? Who are those? that would be the false prophets, and that's our, um, our assignment. That's, that's what we're called to do. So the first thing that um, we should consider is that there is truth. There is the truth. Truth cannot be relative. There are not many different truths. There is just truth in all situations, in every, in every part of life. Uh, in all fields, uh, you look at the sciences, for instance, uh, chemistry, physics, uh, aerodynamics, uh, astronomy, mathematics, whatever those fields may be, there is a truth. And all of those truths are, are measurable. They're predictable. You know what the outcome is going to be if you do certain things. I mean, they are just truths that cannot be altered. Truth exists in every area, in all subject areas and in all areas of life, because what truth is is just simply reality. What is the reality? That's what the truth is. If you go to court, that's what you're trying to find out. What was the reality in the situation? What is the truth? What is reality? What is what really is? And truth cannot contradict itself. You can't have competing realities. It either is this or it's that. You can't have competing. It's just one thing. So as a nature and science, there is truth regarding spiritual matters, and that's what Jesus is dealing with. The truth regarding man, regarding the makeup of man, that there is a spiritual aspect. What is the truth? What is the ultimate reality that every one of us will face or has to deal with? What is the truth? So in relation to the spiritual, and again, for those of all of us here pretty much have grown up in the, you know, the latter half of the 20th century, we went through all of the, the, the new ideas and the, the, the deconstruction of traditional beliefs. And you know, I think it was on the front of one of the, the major magazines back in the 60s or 70s that said, God is dead. And of course, we know where science has taken us and where evolution has taken us. And, and so we've lived through this time period of, of well, basically wanting to, to put, it, put man solely in the material, which is one of the things communism, one of the main proponents of communism is man is just a material being. There is nothing beyond that. And how do we make society work best for the, the here and the now until we die because there's nothing else after that? So is there, what is the reality regarding spiritual things? What is the makeup of man? Are we solely material or do we have a soul? Do we have a spirit that lives on? What is the reality? You know, either there is life after death or there isn't. It's either one way or the other. What's the reality? Either God exists or he doesn't. Either there are many gods or there aren't. Either Jesus is who he claimed to be or he isn't. So what is the reality. And more importantly, how does that reality affect me? That's really the, the, the central issue. Because I can know certain things. I, mean, I can know about astronomy and you know Saturn and Jupiter and the moon and all of it, but it doesn't affect me necessarily. I'm not going to respond to that in some way to determine you know whether I'm going there or whatever. So knowledge in itself does not always affect me. 
But in this case, being a human, whatever that reality is, is going to affect me. So how am I going to respond? What is the reality and what must I do in regard to it? If there's no God, then I just live this life. I die, everything's over, and there's nothing to worry about if that's, if that's the reality. So just eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die, and there's nothing else. It's okay. Let's just make the most of the time we have. As the old beer commercial used to say, you only go around once in life, so go with gusto or something like that. Again, going back to the 60s or 70s. And that's the mentality that really that, that you and I live in is what is in it for me now, the here and now. But if there is a God, I best find out what that means for me. If there is a God, who is he? Or are there many? You know, can Buddha, can Allah, can the, I think it's like 300 million Hindu gods, the millions of Hindu gods, all of the gods of the ancient world, the Greeks and the Romans, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Babylonians, everybody had their gods. And who are they? And can those, if they're real, and the God of the Bible, Yahweh, and Jesus all be one and the same? Is that a possibility? Do Muslims, do Jews, do Christians, do Hindus and Buddhists all worship the same God? And as a lot of people like to say, well, all roads lead to God. It's just a matter of being sincere within the faith that you have, and you'll be okay because in the end, they all go to the top of the same mountain. So it doesn't really matter which one you are. Does it matter? That's, again, a reality, a truth I need to know because if it does matter, I need to find out what the real one is. So what is the reality? Well, God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, multiple times said, I alone am God and there is no other. And that presents a problem. It makes me have to make a decision. Could that be true? Or is it just he says that, but so does everybody else? But even a greater problem is what Jesus had to say because Jesus claimed that he alone is the way to God and that he and the Father are one. We know what John 14 tells us when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through, through me. Now, that's an exclusive statement right there. So it can't be both ways. It can't be that he is a way, and, but there are other ways. Either he is right or he's absolutely wrong. And he's not saying that I am a truth. I am a part of the truth. He said I am the, the only one, exclusive truth. So there's one father, he says, and there's only one way to that father. So Jesus cannot be one with the father, as he said, that I and the father are one. And at the same time, be one with Allah and Buddha and other gods. So, so again, either there is Yahweh God and Jesus is God and one with that father. And that's the only thing there is or that really doesn't exist or it's no different than any other God. But Jesus can't be one with all of them because he only claimed to be one with one. And so Jesus presents the real dilemma here. How do we deal with his claims of exclusivity. Now, Paul dealt with that somewhat when he was in Athens. He showed up in Athens. They got all these gods, statues to all of them, and they even had the statue to the unknown God because in case there's somebody we don't know about, we don't want to miss him because what if that, again, would come back to, uh, you know, to harm us in some way if we don't know? So they even had an image to the unknown God. So that's when Paul took the opportunity to say there's really only one God, the one that created everything, and he doesn't live in temple made by hands and he tried to present the reality of your, your polytheistic system versus really what is the ultimate reality. And they were listening to him until he got to the part about the resurrection. That's when it began. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A guy died and came back to life, but there were some that believed. And then there were others who said, well, we'll hear you another time, but for now, you know, that's all for today. And, and they went on their way because they could not you know, compare or, or accept their system may be being wrong and there being this one reality of the one God 
and all of theirs weren't gods at all, but that's what he was up against, and some did believe. So Jesus claims to be God himself, one with the Father, and the only, the only way to God. So Paul in Corinthians says what? We preach Christ. We preach him crucified. To the Jews, who that's a stumbling block. We don't want our Messiah not going to be crucified. Our Messiah is the king. Our Messiah is going to bring back the, you know, the, the Jewish nation. We're going to become autonomous again. We're not having a Messiah that's crucified. What are we talking about there? And then to the Gentile, that was just foolishness. Do you believe in the guy that got killed and that, that's your God? Like, well, what kind of God is that? So the, the message is difficult. It didn't, it didn't accord with the Jews. It didn't accord with, with the Gentiles. But Jesus is the message. That is really the message. It all boils down to who is Jesus because Jesus himself is the gospel. And when Jesus says, I am the truth, then he is saying there is no other. There's no other way to God. I alone. Therefore, you need to know what I have to say and what your responsibility is. In Galatians Paul said, and we dealt with this at length months ago, he said, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, well, then he is to be accursed As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. And what was he preaching? Christ, Christ crucified. So if Jesus is the truth, then all things have to be measured against him and what he had to say regarding life and regarding eternity. He is the measuring rod of all things. He's the plumb line, and that's something that's used in Old Testament uh, imagery is the plumb line. You measure, is it plumb? Is it straight? How does it agree with or compare to Christ himself? Man cannot afford, he cannot afford to perceive him in any other way than as the truth only, nor fail to take for absolute truth all that he had to say. So Jesus is the gospel. And where does he fit? How do we think of him is really, that's what everything boils down to. That's the only hope we have before God is the righteousness of Christ applied to me because I can't enter of my own accord. I have nothing to offer. So Christ has to be central And this demands a response on the part of every one of us, on the part of every human, because if he is the truth, then we must respond to that truth. And to fail to make any response is making a response of rejection. So failing to respond is still a response. We can't just say, well, I'm neutral on the issue. It either is or it isn't. Either he is or he isn't. Which way am I going to go? So Jesus is telling us here that there is truth and that he alone is is that truth. And that's really the theme of this whole sermon on the mount is this truth and how it then plays out in the life of the believer. What does it look like for a believer to be of the truth, to be of Christ, to be of the kingdom of God? What does it look like? How do I think? What do I do in regard to other people, in regard to God himself, in regard to my religious service, in regard to my trust in God? Every aspect of life then is governed or directed by these truths being lived out. But just as certain as there is always absolute truth because there's always an absolute reality, there are always counterfeits to the truth. Counterfeit money, counterfeit uh, name brand watches and so forth. I mean, you, you, everything is counterfeited. Everything is counterfeited. And so that's what Jesus is dealing with here. He says, you're going to have people who are going to come in, but they're false prophets. They look like prophets. They speak like prophets. They sound like, they sound right in so many ways, but they're false. 
How are you going to tell? How are you going to not be taken in by a charlatan? Now, some people, this may come through them from ignorance. We talked this morning about Apollos. Apollos was, he, he was educated, instructed in some things, but not fully. And so Priscilla and Aquila took him aside to instruct him more fully so that he would know the full truth of the gospel. So if he was proclaiming something false, it was out of ignorance. But once he was instructed fully, then that, now he had, had the truth. But there are many who do it in a calculated, perverse way for self-centered reasons. So it's of primary importance that we seek to know the truth and to live according to it, whatever area of life that we're talking about. But Jesus is warning us here that there are false teachers. There are those who pervert the gospel in one form or another for whatever reason, and he compares them to wolves among sheep. Now, you know what that would look like. I mean, just destruction, you know, um, a wolf. That, that would be a choice meal. And so he's there to devour the sheep. And again, they come in looking like sheep, the way they talk, the way they act, the things that they, they do. Everything about them looks like the sheep. We have another example of that in the parable Jesus told about wheat and tares. Wheat and tares are two plants that look very similar. But one actually has a grain that you can eat and the other is useless. And that they look the same, and they may be sitting in the same church and doing the same things and acting the same way, but one is real and one is a counterfeit. So we have to be able to determine and discern what is true and what is false, what is real and authentic and what is counterfeit. You know, in 2 Timothy, Paul talked about some people who he condemned them when he said, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead. Now think about that, who Jesus is in that aspect, that office, the judge of the living and the dead, everybody. And by his appearing and his kingdom. So I'm, I'm telling you, Timothy, this is important business because Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. His kingdom is at stake. This, this has been established here on the earth. You're responsible for it. You're responsible for maintaining the integrity of it. So what do you do? He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And here are the things he's supposed to do. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. People who want to hear what's pleasing. So let's get the guy, let's go listen to the person that tells me what I want to hear because then I'll feel okay about it. Paul is saying, dangerous, dangerous, destructive, and will lead you only to destruction. Again, the narrow way and the broad way. Well, we see this already in the New Testament. Some of these things were already um, surfacing. Again, the whole book of Galatians was about, do you need to obey the law of the Old Testament? Do you need to get circumcised? Do you need to basically become a Jew in order to become a Christian? That's what the Judaizer said. Unless you become a Jew, really, and circumcision is a must, then you can't really be a Christian. So that's what Paul is refuting all the way through. He said, here are these people who claim Christ, but it's Christ plus. It's Christ and. It's Christ and works or whatever it might be. So he was already refuting that mentality. There's also something we would call asceticism. That's the denial of the body in order to purify oneself. So I give up, I put away, I don't touch, I don't taste, I don't do this or that. And Paul spoke to that too. He said, there are people who are telling you that, that you can't this, that, and the other thing. And that way you, you gain some kind of merit and approval with God. I mean, think of a monk. You know, he, he goes and isolates himself, takes a vow of poverty, a vow of chastity, all these things in order to, that will make him more holy and more acceptable in the eyes of God, this denying the body. Paul says, that's false. You can't do anything anyway. How does that earn you anything with God? 
You're still filthy rags. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. Antinomianism is another thing. Antinomian means against the law. Against the law. So here, it is basically saying the law doesn't pertain to me. I can do anything I want because I'm saved by grace. It's only my spirit that's really my soul is being saved. It doesn't really matter what I do with my body. And it gives me license to do anything I want because by grace I've been saved. And so this idea of antinomianism of just, just fulfilling any desire I want because that's my body and the body and the soul are separate so it doesn't really matter. Gnostics. Gnostics were people who said, well, now there's a special knowledge. And unless you come in with us and get this mystical revelation, you're not going to be able to fully know God. It's going into a deeper level. It kind of reminds me of like Christian science or some of those types of things where you, you, know, you reach different levels and eventually you'll get to the level of clear, whatever group that is. And, and you know, somehow then there's this mystical, magical thing that happens. And, and you basically, again, are responsible for all of that. And... Uh, and so there's this special knowledge that you have to have. And these were already, again, coming into the church, even in the first century. Docetism was another thing. And there, really, there, was, there were multiple aspects of what this pertains to, and that's who is Jesus? Is he fully God? Is he fully man? Docetism would say he wasn't really a man at all, which if that's the case, it takes away from the whole act you know, the, the need for this person to be a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of David, to have all the genealogies that we see in, in the New Testament of who Jesus was. If he didn't have, if he wasn't human, then he didn't substitute for me as a human. So I still have no savior. And yet there are people who are proposing that, that, that it's just, he was just a spirit. I mean, there are all kind of heretical uh, beliefs about the, who Jesus was, you know, be it his deity or his humanity, and so, again, how many messages are being put out there that, that somehow add to or take away from or, or distort the gospel? And what these all ultimately do is they deny Christ, that he is the only sufficient and necessary means for salvation. They skew the gospel because they skew who Jesus is. And if we don't get who Jesus is right, there is no hope for us. We have to know who he was and believe the truth. And all of these things are all, always man-centered. They adjust the gospel in some way to, again, um, accommodate what I want, those itching ears. And there are so many today. We watched uh, two videos in, on Sunday nights, I think it was, months ago, called The American Gospel, and it brought out a lot of these just false teachings, mystical things, things that somehow combine biblical ideas but with all kind of other weird stuff and or denied certain aspects of scripture and so those aren't even they don't pertain they don't matter because well only certain parts of the scripture do but other parts don't and 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 again it's it's either an, it's an either or situation but they're man-centered that they agree with me i i I develop it in a way that still satisfies me that somehow my spiritual man is being ministered to, but not according to truth. These things are all religious. You know, we're not talking about those who deny Christ. We're talking about people who look like Christians, who, who speak the language. And so whether it be Buddha or Allah or those other things, that, that we might be able to see more clearly. But the one we need to be concerned with is what about those who are within what is known as Christianity? Where might we be fooled by teachings that have the appearance of truth but are false in one way or the other? So that's what Jesus is telling us. These are people that are going to look like you, sound like you, be involved with you, live among you, but you've got to be careful. So in all things, Christ must be at the center, and it must be the Christ of Scripture, not one that we want to adjust, not that we want to, to, to kind of fashion in our own image, and boy, there are so many of those today. I don't know. I've not studied this deeply, but you may have seen commercials uh, uh, from um, a group called uh, He Gets Me. And it's all about who Jesus is in relation to mankind. And it's all about his identification with us as people and how he loves and cares and identifies with everybody. Whatever your situation in life may be, whatever your gender identity might be, you know, whatever your you know, sexual identity might be, whatever 
whatever aspect of life, well, but, but he gets me. So they've taken Jesus to make him palatable to man so that I can still have Jesus, but I have a Jesus that's not scriptural. I have a Jesus that I have accommodated to me so that I can be satisfied and still even maybe call myself Christian. You know, Jesus is spoken of today as a revolutionary. He was against everything. So people today like the idea of, well, yeah, we're going to be anti this and anti that and, and revolutionary. And, and, and he's our model. Or that he was a liberal because, again, he stood against the, the, the main the main tradition of the mainstream and so Jesus if he were here today he would be on the side again of all these other things I mean we 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 can see Jesus skewed all around us if we just look so scripture alone has to be our truth that's why we went to John 17 when Jesus said sanctify them in the truth your word is truth and I sanctify myself so that they too may be sanctified in the truth. Sanctified means set apart made uh, separate unto something and so Jesus is saying only the word of God can sanctify set them apart guide their minds guard them direct them to truth your word alone is truth. So who Jesus is matters. Who Jesus is and our version, our vision, our perception of him. So we need to know who he said he was. Fully God, fully man, the only savior of mankind. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist said. God, fully, one with the Father. I came from you, I'm going back. But all the words that Jesus said about who he is and the I am statements of Jesus, which he intentionally used to identify himself with the great I am that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, I am. And you know when they came to arrest him and he said, I am he, they fell backwards because of the power of his words. So did they arrest him? No, he gave himself up to them. Because he is the great I am. He was the creator of the world. It tells us that in, in Hebrews. I mean, he has always been. He, he is God fully. So then we need to know for sure, why did he come? Was it just to be a good teacher, a good example, to make us feel better, to, to show us how we ought to live? Or was he here to accomplish the purpose of the, the rescue of man by dying for our sins and then what has he done? You know, what was the cross? What was his life? Why did that matter? Why did the cross matter? What about the resurrection? What has he done? And what does the Bible tell us regarding that? And what will he do? What is he saying will come about in the end? Who is he in the final analysis when it all is culminated? Who does Jesus say that he is? The book of Revelation is really clear. The book of Revelation, to me, is not worrying about who is what in that picture. As far as man and nations and where, where or when or the numbers, Jesus Christ is central in the book of Revelation. He is the revelation. That's what it's all about. And what he ends up doing is all that matters. So I need to be aligned with him because otherwise, when he comes with coals of fire, hair of white, a sword flaming out of his mouth, and he is killing his enemies, and the blood is up to the, the bridle on the horses, I don't want to be anywhere but with him because he is the coming judge the finisher of all things he is the king of kings and lord of lords so we'll read you something c.s lewis had to say about jesus some of you know he the author of many christian books the chronicles of narnia uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and all those things, but many very deep Christian books, a very, very deep thinker, an atheist as a younger man, came to Christ, never was a preacher, but he was, he was a, really a, a religious philosopher of a sense. He, he, he spoke about the truths of God in his book. And it says that um, he was concerned that there were too many people who were saying that Jesus was a good teacher, that he was a noble, moral leader, was a man of compassion and great wisdom. And to paint him as this nice, noble, compassionate, kind, insightful teacher, Lewis said, he was convinced that that was just not an option that was possible. He said, that is not possible, a possible consideration of Jesus. 
He could not be a good man. He could not be a moral man. He could not be a religious teacher. He could not be a trustworthy leader. He could not be wise. He could not be a spiritual mentor only because of one very important matter, and it is this. He claimed to be God. And as soon as he claimed to be God, he eliminated himself from that other category. Because good people, wise people, sensible people don't think they are God, and they don't want other people to think that you're God either. So if he was a good moral teacher and yet claimed to be God, those don't add up. You can't be just this and not that. He goes on to say that Jesus has even been deemed by many people as very humble, very meek and mild. Well, humility is not compatible with declaring that you're the God of the universe, that you're the creator, that you have been alive eternally, that you made everything that is in existence, and that you are the final judge of everyone, and you will reign over everything forever and ever. That's a pretty bold statement. That doesn't go along with the idea that we think of as humble and meek. So as soon as Jesus declared that he was God the Son, that he had the same nature as God, as soon as he said, if you've seen me, you've seen God, it was no longer possible to simply designate him as a good teacher. That is not open. That is not an open uh, option. Good, sensible, wise men don't make such outrageous claims. So one of three things is true. Jesus is either a lunatic on the level of somebody who thinks he's a poached egg, and these again are Lewis's words, or he's a liar at such a calculated, clever, and extreme level as to probably be unequaled as a seller of deception, or he is Lord. But forget the nonsense that he's a good teacher. That's just not an option. He's either a crazy man, he's either a liar that was willing even to die for that, or he is who he said he is. So again, going back to John 18, for this I have been born, Jesus said, and for this I have come into the world, why? To testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And then that's when Pilate said, well, what is truth? Because he grew up in the world of the pagan world of mythology and multiple gods and philosophies. He had no idea. There was no one truth. Jesus said, I am, and I came to testify it. So that's the all-important question. What is truth? Where do we find it? How do we recognize it? And how do we recognize the difference between the authentic and the counterfeit? And again, we're not talking about denying the existence, but denying the totality of what scripture tells us about Jesus, the fullness of his message. But it's not only what is falsely said about Jesus, but it's also what is not said about Jesus when we think of false prophets. I mean, have you ever heard the sales pitch, but they didn't tell you everything? They just told you the things you wanted to hear to get you to to make the purchase, But then later you find out, oh, there were some strings attached or, you know, uh, I didn't read between the lines. So often it's what is not said. So Martin Lloyd-Jones pointed these things out. He said, one of the things that you won't hear from a false prophet often is sermons and teachings on holiness, on righteousness, on the wrath of God about being holy and living unto God according to his standard, seeking to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, dying to myself, that holiness and the judgment of God that will come. The truth, then, is concealed. It's not that the truth is not there at all. It's only partial or it's distorted. What did Romans 1 tell us? Romans 1, powerful, powerful chapter about man, about who we really are as human beings. But in verse 18 of Romans 1, it says, for the wrath of God. So here's the wrath. I mean, how many times in the Bible, even in the New Testament, the wrath of God is everywhere. So how can we ignore it? How can we say to people, not even let them know that it's out there? What kind of service is that to them? 
So it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness. So obviously God wants holiness and righteousness, godliness. And it's revealed against them who are men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They just didn't say it. They just suppressed it, held it back, kept it covered up. We don't want that out. So when we talk about false prophets, it's people who don't tell everything there is to be told about what the Bible tells us about who God is, who Jesus is, the consequences that come if we fail to believe on him. If we don't speak the truth entire, entirely, the fullness of the gospel, then we are guilty before God really of lying of covering up, of concealing truth. And if you were in a court of law and you concealed something that you had, you could be held guilty. And that's what happens to the believer who doesn't share the full truth. We could be guilty before God. We're basically painting a distorted picture of who God is if we only want to point to one thing about God. If we don't Talk about the final judgment. Again, how many times is that brought up? Hebrews 9, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that comes judgment. Hebrews 10, for if, we go, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But this is what remains, a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. That's God. A fury of fire consuming his adversaries who turn away from the truth. There is judgment. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says that on more than one occasion. What about sin? What do we tell people about sin? Often sin is just downplayed. It's, it's referred to as a weakness, or a mistake that we made, or, you know, I'm just human. You know, we, we want to excuse ourselves in regard to sin. And we don't even want to acknowledge, we talked about this this morning, and Daniel actually had the answer to this in Sunday school about we are all born with a sin nature. We are sinners by nature. We don't, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's what the Bible tells us clearly about who we are. And if we don't talk about the sin nature of man, the depravity of man, and everyone is under the wrath of God until they come to Christ, then we are doing them a disservice and we're dishonoring God because we're not given the full message of Christ. Sin is the issue that we're dealing with, and it condemns every one of us before God. And unless Christ's righteousness is applied to me, I don't have anything to offer to God but sin that will be that consuming fire that we just read about in Hebrews. And Romans 3 is very clear. There is none righteous, no, not one. The atonement, that means the sacrifice that had to be paid to God for our sin. We don't always deal with that. And there are some, and we listened again, some of these on that American gospel, who are call themselves Christian, read the Bible, teach the Bible, but they don't like the idea of the atonement. They call it cosmic child abuse, God killing his own son. Well, if God didn't, then you and I have no hope because somebody's got to pay for that sin. And if Jesus didn't pay for it, I'm paying for it in eternity. We read last week about the rich man and Lazarus and how the rich man was in torment. He said, just let Lazarus dip his finger in the water and touch my tongue. I'm in such misery and torment. The atonement had to be made. It was the payment for our sin that was a transaction between God and Christ. He is paying the Father. He is accepting the full punishment of God, not only the punishment of, of, the man, of man, which many thousands of people have died horrible deaths for Christ. His was he was the only man who could endure the wrath of God on himself. And cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everything went dark. This was something you and I could never, ever comprehend, I believe. What was the whole action of the cross about? The payment of sin. But we don't like that. People don't like to talk about the cross other than sometimes, well, 
Well, it was a good example of what it looks like to fully love somebody and, and love overrules everything and it conquers. And we need to live that kind of sacrificial. That's not what the cross was. That's why Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified because it's only the cross in the atoning work that was done there that rescues us, that pays our penalty, that allows us to go free in Christ. So not to talk about the cross as it really is, is again, it's a dishonor, it's a misrepresentation of God. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. That's what we hear all around us, the cleverness of the, of the clever, the wisdom of, the, of the, the, the worldly wise man. He said that is to be completely set aside. It, it has no value, no worth, because the power of God is in the cross. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness, again, of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews, that's a stumbling block. To Gentiles, it's just foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jew and Greek, Christ. Again, the gospel. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That is the cross. And apart from his substitutionary death, there is no payment for sin apart from us making payment for all eternity. And one last thing that, again, is not very appetizing to us is, is the gospel of repentance. Repentance, you have to turn, you have to let go, you have to leave, you have to forsake anything else that you're clinging to apart from Christ. And yet that was the very first message that both Jesus and John the Baptist preached. They went about preaching repentance. Repentance. We have to turn, turn away from the things that we are hoping in, whether it be my good works, my religion, my any, whatever it might be, there is nothing except Christ alone. And we must tell people, you have to repent. You can't just decide for Christ and then go on living your way and think that you've got now a path somehow that gets you entry into heaven. But repent, turn. It's the lordship of Christ. And if you're not willing to have the lordship of Christ, then Christ isn't willing to have you. He said, no one is worthy of me if they count anything, even their own life is more precious. No, I have to be all in all. That's a hard message. That's the narrow road. The broad road is do all kind of good things. Be, be religious. Be all these wonderful things that you can be, and that will serve you. And we're getting ready to come next week to, Lord, Lord, did we not do this and that in your name? And he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What am I hoping in? What Am I doing? Am I repenting? Am I turning? Well, failing to say these things could well explain why the church is in the state that it is in today. The church has tried to accommodate the world, to make it look like the world, make it appealing to the world, make it palatable. We try to fashion God in a way that will be acceptable because we don't want to present the fullness of God because people are going to turn away from that. The emphasis perhaps has been more on getting people to come to church than to come to Christ. Christ alone saves. It's a hard message. The message has been watered down. It's been, it's been softened to make it appealing and and we, we kind of laugh sometimes when we uh, talk about this quote from Bodie Bauckham when he says, we're presenting a sissified Jesus, meek and mild and basically at the, the, the beck and call of the man instead of him being the king and man must submit to him. Because Jesus is that one, as he said earlier, who's coming on a horse with a flaming sword out of his mouth and his coals, eyes are like coals of fire and hair white, and he's coming as the reigning and conquering king. That's who Jesus is. Where do I stand in regard to that Jesus? So the false prophet does not only teach what is false, he doesn't teach what is entirely true from the scripture. And he's failed to deliver the message in its entirety. So basically, he has lied if we don't tell the fullness of of what scripture says. 
He has suppressed the truth in unrighteousness and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what is truth? It's the fullness of scripture, every jot and tittle, everything that is there. We must examine, we must seek to to understand and seek to apply. And we cannot be afraid to let it examine us. Think of it from a medical perspective. We may not want to hear what he has to say, but do we want to not know and live in, you know, in, in deception about the reality in the body? The scripture must have authority. We must be willing to let it examine us. We can't cling to certain parts and not to others. So when we talk about doctrinal things, for instance, the wrath of God, we, we, we love the part about the love of God and the mercy of God and the kindness of God, and those are all true. But they're no more true than the wrath and the justice and the vengeance of God either. We can't hold on to certain things that we like and other things that we don't. That's those people who had itching ears. So it's faith in the truth of God and the whole truth of God and the truth about the whole aspect of who God and Christ are. It may be painful, but it's the only hope we have for the cure of our sin disease and the hope for life from death. Because the consequences of truth cannot be avoided and they cannot be escaped. Because remember, it's reality. So if I go up on the steeple and jump off, believing that I can fly, truth is going to prevail. And I'll find out what it really is. I can tell myself all I want. I can convince myself and work up all kinds of of, of belief. But truth is going to win. The consequences cannot be avoided and they can't be escaped. Where do you stand in regard to the truth? Where do you stand in regard to Christ? Because truth will win out. There is a coming day. Do you know the truth that you're living by? Have you submitted yourself? Are you willing to submit yourself to the truth? But the beauty of it is this. Only in the word of God do we find the truth. But here's what the word of God does. John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We're all in chains. If we're living in our flesh, if we're living according to my nature, I am in chains. I'm enchained to sin. I'm enchained to, I'm enslaved to to destruction, to, to misery, to eternal death. Only the truth of God found in the worth of God can set us free, but it can. That's why Jesus came to testify to the truth. And those who are of the truth, hear my voice. Are you of the truth? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. Am I of the truth? Do I hear the voice of Christ? Am I abiding by that? Am I seeking it? Is it changing me? Does it have any impact in me at all? Or am I just trying to be a good moral person? Am I satisfied with that? That's still living in deception if that's the case. You therefore, beloved... Knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. Be on your guard. That's why Jesus said, beware of false prophets. You got to know. You got to know. But, he says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Well, God, help us. Praise you, God, that you are such a loving, good God that you did not hide the truth from us. You have made it fully revealed. Lord, don't let us shy away. Don't let us turn our eyes away, but help us to look squarely into the truth. Look into that mirror that shows me who I really am, because only then can I be set free. Be gracious with us, God. In the midst of our humanity, our ignorance, our rebellion, whatever the human nature puts forth, oh God, be gracious to conquer us, 
Call us to yourself. Make us your people and glorify yourself in us because only your name alone deserves glory and honor. God, help us. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing.